one thing that you should be aware of, and that is this tendency for students to want to elevate the status of their teachers. And primarily, then they do this by making wild claims of miraculous powers and high levels of realization. But you have to understand, I'm not saying there aren't teachers with high levels of realization. There are, but they're extremely rare. They're as rare as a daytime star. But the way people go on, one could be led to believe that highly realized spiritual beings are commonplace. The truth is that they're very rare, and not only that, but they're getting more and more rare as time goes on. Now the question is, why do students try to exaggerate or elevate the status of their teachers? And this isn't something that just happens in the West. This is also a phenomena in the East. And it's not necessarily done with ill intention. For example, many people who are newbies on the spiritual path have this tendency to exaggerate. They get a bit excited and carried away. And so they're always talking about ghosts and demons and things like that. Now, that itself isn't necessarily harmful. It can be slightly difficult for the individual because, as I said before, when we start off, we're very enthusiastic and we tend to get carried away. And then as we progress, our practice kind of levels out and it's easy to become stale and jaded, lose heart because things no longer seem so significant. We feel as if we had special experiences early on in our practice and then later on we can't get back there and we wonder why. It's got to do with this tendency, this kind of childish tendency to get a bit overexcited. For example, whenever somebody finds a new hobby, you know, if they start surfing or sailboarding, then they're really, really into it at first. But over time, then the enthusiasm wears off. Now this tendency to exaggerate out of being overly enthusiastic can also be harmful to the Dharma in general and to others. And that's because if you're always exaggerating the spiritual path, then many people are going to write you off as either a lunatic or even somebody who's been brainwashed. We think that if we praise our lamas, then it will be beneficial for their activities. My feeling is in the long run, it's actually quite a negative thing because people will no longer take you seriously. To start off with, most people think that spiritual and religious practitioners are a little bit naive and superstitious. And so if you're always going on about it, uh, then that's only going to reinforce their negative opinion of you and a negative opinion of the spiritual path in general. And there's another thing. It's quite annoying. If somebody's going on about something they're really enthusiastic about, but you're really not that interested in it, then it can be quite tedious. I mean, you'll all know this. If you get a friend and he starts a new hobby and he's really enthusiastic about it, he could be talking to you about model trains day and night and you might humor him at first but in the end it's going to get quite irritating because you don't see it to be that special it's good to be enthusiastic if you can keep your enthusiasm it's even better but that's not the main thing there's also a cultural aspect here because in the tibetan dharma especially then we're supposed to see our teachers as being really special in fact we're taught that we should see our teachers to be buddha see your root lama to be the Buddha himself. Now the problem here is we don't understand what a root lama is. We don't even understand what a spiritual teacher is. What most people do is they hear some big name, let's say the Karmapa or the Dalai Lama, and they think, well, that must be my teacher because they're the most famous. They must be the best teacher because they're the most famous. So they go chasing after them. And then they think that teacher is their root lama. And that's not the way it works. There's two ways of classifying the root lama. In the Mahamudra tradition, then the root lama is the one who gives you the pointing out instructions for the nature of mind, if they're successful. From that day onwards, that lama is your root lama. But that's extremely rare. Hardly anybody comes to realize the true nature of mind. In the Nyingma tradition, then anyone who gives you an empowerment 
then becomes your root lemma. But the problem here is that we very readily will seek empowerment, and we seek empowerment from people we don't even know. We haven't checked them out, and that is a dangerous thing. You're in danger of taking on someone as your root lemma who you hardly even know. You don't know anything about them, whether they're actually authentic or not. And this is a really mistaken way of thinking. Thinking that if I'm going to have a teacher, then they have to be the most famous teacher, or the most famous teacher is the best. Well, actually, these famous high lamas are not the best sort of teacher to have. And the reason is they're too busy. They spend all their time traveling around the world and they have absolutely millions of students. And there's just no way to make a special connection with these teachers. And this is the thing. The root lama is a teacher with whom you have a special connection, a very personal connection, and especially a connection that goes from lifetime to lifetime. So rather than rushing to the feet of the most famous lama you can find, you should spend some more time searching for your root lama. Also, it's really essential to make aspirations because it's not easy to meet your root lama in this life. Again, this comes down to the point where we see there to be so many awakened beings, so many special teachers, they're left, right and center, and we also think it's relatively easy to find a root lama, or they'll just appear to us. It's not like that. It's actually a really difficult thing to do. Anyway, the point is, we don't even understand what a root lama is. We don't understand what a lama is, in fact. A lama is somebody who has special qualities, and we've never studied, so we don't know what those qualities are. And so it's quite foolish to assume somebody is your teacher, and then to take them to be Buddha when you know nothing about them. And then it leads to all kinds of negative consequences. Because if you take someone on as your teacher, and then later you give rise to wrong view, you see them to be quite a negative person, then this is very harmful to you spiritually. That's because we have something called Samaya with our teachers. It's a sacred commitment. Once we've taken someone on as our root lama, then it's very dangerous to give rise to negative thoughts about that individual. So you're much better off taking your time and investigating and not being impatient. Finding your root lama is something that could take many lifetimes. It's just like awakening. It's not easy. So this cultural aspect is also quite negative because it gets people into all kinds of trouble. And this is something that has happened quite a lot recently in North America. For example, there's Sogyal Rinpoche. He wrote a very famous book called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And he founded an organization called Rigpa that has centers all over the world. Then many thousands of students took him on as their root teacher. But in the end, what happened is the students took him to court and chased him out of the country. And I don't know anything about this situation. I had no idea what this Lama did or why his students eventually took over his centers and chucked him out. But I bet you, when he first started teaching his students, they spent a lot of time praising him, calling him a Buddha, and extolling his miraculous abilities and high levels of realization. In the end, they saw him to be a common criminal, maybe even a rapist. And this reflects badly on the Buddha Dharma. Don't get carried away. Take your time, try to be realistic. It's going to be of much more benefit to you. And I can say with a lot of certainty that this negative tendency to use the cultural framework of Tibetan Buddhism in the West has led to people losing faith in the Buddha Dharma. In fact, many people think Tibetan Buddhism is quite negative. And it's because of this sort of thing. But this is kind of unintentional. And it comes from our own ignorance, not knowing the score, not understanding the context of the Buddha Dharma and what it means to be a root lama, taking it lightly. But there is another far more negative reason why people have this tendency to build up their teachers with exaggeration and hyperbole. And that's because the students themselves have a lot of negative emotions. They've got the kleshas and they've got them strong. And so what they do is they hope to improve their own status in the spiritual community by elevating the status of their teacher. If it were the case that these students merely had great faith and devotion in their teachers, And their feeling was that if they praised their teachers to others, it would help to spread the potency of their activities and also possibly to spread the word of the Buddha Dharma. Then it wouldn't be so bad. But there's still a fault here. There's still a danger here. And this explains why my own teacher says to his students, do not praise me to others. The way my Lama talks about his teacher, Kempo Chuchap, is very different from the way that Westerners talk about their teachers. He says he lived in a small wooden shack on the side of the mountain and had hardly any money whatsoever. 
He only had a teapot and a bowl and didn't even own his own texts. If somebody wanted to request a particular teaching, they would have to bring the text with them and give it to Kempo Chujap, and then he would teach from that. So he had very few possessions and almost no money. And if he did acquire a small amount of money, what he would do is he would buy some soup, some noodle soup for his students. Now to us, that doesn't sound like praise. It sounds like a criticism. Oh yeah, that guy's an old beggar living on a mountain and he's got a bit of money to buy some instant noodles for his students. We don't see that to be praise. For us, a spiritual teacher should be something like a king who sits on a throne, but that's not what a spiritual practitioner is like. Just read the works of Patro Rinpoche. Look at what his life was like. He wandered from place to place on foot. He wouldn't even ride a yak or a horse. Most people didn't even recognize him. They thought he was an old man or a beggar. Anyway, what we see to be praise isn't the same as what a Dharma practitioner would see to be praise. And so you have to be careful of what you say, because actually you might embarrass your Lama. Anyway, I'll give you an example. And this is a story that my teacher often tells. And it isn't about Westerners, it's about people in Tibet. And the point is, the situation in Tibet is getting worse and worse every year. There was this student of a Tibetan Lama, and he was praising him. What he said was, my Lama was the first one in his district to own an SUV. Now that's very similar to the way we think, because we have very worldly minds. Now this phenomena of exaggerating the qualities of one's Lama isn't something reserved solely for the West. It happens in the East as well, and it's very similar. In the West, we like to big up our Lamas, and by association then we up our own status in the world. But this also happens in the East, because for all of the big Lamas, then they have an official office. It's called the Labrang. The Labrang looks after the affairs of the teacher, and especially when that teacher passes on, that Labrang remains in control of the Lama's assets until their reincarnation is found. And of course, when their reincarnation is found, it's just a young child. And so there are many years where that child is developing and being educated. And throughout that period, then the Lama's office is in control. It's very much in their personal interest to promote the name of their teacher. For example, there's nothing that special about being an attendant, right? It's kind of like being a servant. But if you're an attendant of a special Lama, like the Dalai Lama or the Karmapa, then that gives you a very high status in the spiritual world. So there's a story I heard, and it's about a young Tuku, a young child who was recognized as the reincarnation of a famous Lama. One day they went walking up the mountain. The young child started digging the ground. Well, young children do that, right? They just play. And there was nothing in the hole. And then later, everyone left. And the next morning, what happened is they came back and the hole was filled with ancient relics. Now, these things weren't there when the child was digging, but they appeared the next day. And more than likely what had happened is, in the night, the attendant came up the hill and filled the hole with religious relics. Now, what's the purpose of doing this? And that's because anything you do to add to the legacy of a toku increases their fame and fortune in the world. And those associated with them, in turn, become more powerful and more respected. Whether you're in the West or you're in the East, most of us are ordinary human beings. We've got the clashes, we've got negative emotions. So we've got a lot of ego clinging and pride. And so what we do is we spend all our time trying to improve our own status in the world. And I think this is quite an extreme example. This isn't what happens usually. It's a cultural thing. We're supposed to have great faith and devotion to our teachers and see them to be the very emanation of the Buddha. And this doesn't only happen within spiritual communities. It happens in totally worldly organizations. For example, if you're on the board of directors in a big company, then it's very much in your interest to ingratiate the CEO and curry his or her favor. And likewise, we are easily corrupted by this relationship. You can see this very clearly with the inner circle of powerful men like Trump, for example. Many of these people have engaged in extremely negative activity, breaking the law and lying outright, and they do so in order to encourage favor from their leader. It's a natural human tendency. The problem is we don't recognize that nearly all of us are completely worldly beings. And there are very few exceptional beings in the world and in the spiritual path. And also like children, we have this tendency to get carried away, to get wrapped up into our herd mentality. And so once we join an organization or a spiritual community, it's very easy for us to leave behind our normal standard of acceptable conduct. And this is part of the process whereby many spiritual communities go wrong. They go wrong and they get worse and worse over time until eventually something really horrible happens. 
You don't want to contribute to this kind of activity. You don't want to contribute to your own downfall. And also, you don't want to do anything that is going to ruin the spiritual path for others. The spiritual path is not easy, but it's my belief that it does lead to emancipation from suffering. And in fact, as the Buddha taught, ultimately, it's the only chance we have to go beyond the mundane world. And so if you ruin this opportunity for others, then that's very negative and damaging to them, but also will accumulate for oneself great stores of negative karma. And it's my sincere wish that you should find happiness and well-being and progress swiftly along the spiritual path to final awakening and liberation from suffering and the six realms of samsara. So it's good to be back here at the retreat. It's been quite difficult over the last few months. My mother's health situation has been continually deteriorating. But for the time being, then things have stabilized. And so, again, I'm able to record a few videos. So that's about all I had to say today. And until next time, then see you later.